Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago out of the book of Exodus. We're going through the ten plagues. And I'm curious, I did not review this last week, how many of you remember the plagues that we have studied so far in proper order? Do you remember the little mnemonic device that I gave you so that you can remember the plagues in order? Blow, fro, lie, fly, moo, bow, and halo. Okay. Blow, fro, blood and frogs. Blow, fro, lie, fly, that's lice and flies. Moo, bow, that's the cattle murrain, the plague of the cattle. And the bow is the boils. And then halo, that's hail and locusts. So blow, fro, lie, fly, moo, bow, and halo. I didn't see a whole lot of lips moving out there. Uh, let's try it together. Blow, fro, together. Blow, fro, lie, fly, moo, bow, halo. All right. I hope that if someday somebody asks you, what were the ten plagues of Egypt? You'll be able to tell them because you remember that little teeny mnemonic device, what we call a budak, uh, so that you can go through them. And I hope you remember something more than merely the names of the plagues because, after all, God used those to teach us things about the last days in which we live. We're seeing a lot of these things getting ready to happen here in the United States and worldwide. Now, last week we looked at this plague of the locusts. God gave a lot of verses to it. We looked at part four, and we learned the final le lesson from the plague of lo locusts, which is that locusts are usually seen in the Bible as a sign of the judgment of God. And the Bible says a lot about locusts. Somebody told me this past week, they weren't sure that the Bible said a lot about locusts, so they looked it up in their concordance, and the Bible says a lot about locusts. Locusts show up all over the place in the Bible. And uh, so I hope that you have done some of that kind of a study. Now, what we started with last week was Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28, right after the children of Israel entered the promised land. You recall that God commanded the tribes to divide in half, and half of them were to stand on Mount Ebal, and half were to stand on Mount Gerizim. And if there were only two million Jews, I think there were more than that that came out of Egypt, but if there were only two million, that means a million on each mountain, shouting the blessings and the cursings of God. Those who stood on Mount Gerizim pronounced the blessings of God. Those who stood on Mount Ebal pronounced the curses of God. Two million people, at least, shouting at the top of their lungs. Do you think this might have uh, had an impact on the children that were listening? That's what God designed it for. And an impact on those who were shouting those blessings and cursings. I think I would rather have been standing on Mount Gerizim than on Mount Ebal, getting to say the blessings, but... God divided the tribes up, and that's how he told them to do it. And God said, if you obey me, you'll get these blessings, and he lists a whole bunch of them. And if you disobey me, you will get these curses, and he lists a whole bunch of them. And one of those curses was the curse of the locusts. Chapter 28, verse 38, Thou shalt carry much seed into the field, thou shalt gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. And they had just been in Egypt and seen the plague of locusts. All thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. So we tied that in with Galatians chapter 6. I hope you remember that. Because what we're talking about is a law of harvest. The locusts ate the stuff that grew. And when you sow properly in the spiritual realm, you reap properly in the spiritual realm. And when you sow improperly in the spiritual realm, the locusts will eat it up. It'll come to nothing. Galatians 6, 7 through 9, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And we talked about how easy it is to get discouraged, how easy it is to give up, how easy it is to quit our well-doing, doing what God wants us to do, because we don't see results. We are so results-oriented instead of obedience-oriented. We need to learn that what God expects is obedience, not results. Do what's right, 
leave the results to God. I learned that back in high school. I don't know if I heard it from somebody or if I simply came up with that, but it's, boy, that has stuck with me all my life. Do right, leave the results to God. Our responsibility is not results. Our responsibility is obedience. Do right, leave the results to God and be not weary in well-doing. And Paul says that also over in 2 Thessalonians 3.13, but ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And we gave you many different illustrations of the law of harvest. And the law of harvest relates to works. It does not relate to salvation. It relates to our works. Salvation relates to faith. The law of harvest relates to works. And we looked at a many different passages out of Obadiah, out of Isaiah, out of Proverbs, out of Second Samuel, out of the book of Revelation, out of the book of Isaiah, out of the book of Psalms. Um, I wish we had time to look at all of those things. We looked at one passage out of the book of Revelation. Uh, but I want to add a few more verses today that we did not look at last week. I mentioned some of them in passing, but they're important for us to understand. The Bible has a lot to say about our works. Now, Bible-believing fundamentalists normally don't like to talk about works because we're focused on faith. Those in the Reformed tradition don't like to talk about works because we're focused on faith. We won't go back to that battle with Roman Catholicism, you know, back in the days of Martin Luther and Calvin and all the others who have stood for faith, whereas Rome was pressing for works, but Rome pressed for works either for salvation or for sanctification. The Bible doesn't do that. And the Reformers responded properly. They said, no, salvation and sanctification are both by faith. The grace of God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture alone, not scripture plus tradition of Rome. The scripture alone. And they fought the battle well. But I'm afraid that as a result, Satan has said, all right, you want to go that way, then I will take you totally away from what the Bible says about works. Because you see, the devil doesn't care where he gets you. He just cares if he gets you. If he can get you over here, that's where he'll get you. And that's where the church came under bondage for, for centuries with Rome. The reformers responded properly, no salvation by grace through faith. Satan says, okay, well, let, let's get them all the way away from works. We don't want them to do anything practical. We don't want them to, to live lives that are pleasing to God. We don't want them to think that their works are important. Just keep walking by faith, walking by faith. Yes, yes, but walking by faith produces results. Remember that. Walking by faith produces results and it produces results that are visible in your life and in the way in which you respond to people around you in the world. Very important. Your life is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. So how are you proving it? James says, you know, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. The way that you prove faith is by the way in which you live. That is a very important doctrine of Scripture. And there are literally hundreds of verses that support it. Let me give you a few that we did not look at last week. Ephesians chapter 2, you all know verse 8. You know verses 9 and 10. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we say, yes, the grace of God. Faith, it's not of works. You're saved by grace through faith. That's verse 8. Now let's read the rest of the context. Verses 9 and 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You wouldn't walk in them unless God had before ordained them. God has predestinated good works in the life of every person who is a genuine Christian. And if somebody claims to be a Christian and it never shows up in their life, you know what? They're phonies. They've got plastic bananas hanging on uh, pine trees. And plastic bananas don't grow on pine trees. It looks like they're bearing fruit and they're green all year long, but you go up and test the fruit and it's plastic. How many of you have a pine tree or a spruce or a fir tree or conifer of some kind out in your yard? Some of you do. Yeah, yeah, I've got to see a few hands out there. Would you be surprised if you came out tomorrow morning and you saw grapes and bananas and other things hanging on that tree? Yes. Not pine cones. <laughs> Folks, 
Jesus said, by their fruit ye shall know them. What kind of fruit are you bearing in your life? That was Ephesians 2, 9 through 10. How about 1 Timothy 9, 15? Here's one specifically for women. Bible, actually there are several that I'm going to give you here this morning where, where the Bible has some, some very important verses concerning works and women. This is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness. Next three words, here they are. How does God expect you to dress up? He says, you know, what, what makes you beautiful is, is not how fancy your clothes are, not how much gaudy jewelry you're, you're wearing, the cheap dime store stuff, you know. Here it is. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. That's the woman that God says is beautiful. All the other things are external. And then he goes on, he says, But let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. For I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, but Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, listen to this. Last verse. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. In other words, with good works that are reflected in the way in which they live. You know, Judy bore me 13 children. And we laid hold on this because childbirth, and some of you ladies know this, is very hard. And there are women who have died in childbirth. This is a special promise here. Notwithstanding, shall she be saved, that is, delivered in childbearing, if they, that's the couple, the husband and the wife, continue in faith and charity and holiness. Holiness is a manner of life. It's not some kind of ephemeral thing that's sort of out there in space and sort of radiates in you sometimes kind of thing. Holiness is the way in which we live with sobriety. That's with seriousness of mind. Another one for women, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 through 15. Here it's dealing with widows. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old. In other words, the church shouldn't support any widow who is less than 60 years old having been the wife of one man, well reported of, three words, four good works. Suppose you've got somebody who becomes a widow. She says, I'm 61. The church ought to take care of me. Well, there are a couple of other things in the passage that says who ought to take care of her first. But, but they look at her life and they say, you know, you spent all your time gadding about. You spent all your time down at the mall shopping. You spent all your time going from neighbor to neighbor and gossiping. You spent all your time sitting in front of the television popping grapes into your mouth or chocolates or whatever happens to be your thing. The church is to take care of the widows who are over 60, not younger than that, who are over 60, who have shown in their life they have diligently followed every good work, well reported of for good work, if she have brought up children. If she have lodged strangers, there's hospitality. If she have washed the saints' feet, that is humility. If she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. You know, these are passages, folks, that nobody ever looks at. And most of the time, we simply count on society through, you know, a pension fund or through Social Security or something else, else to take care of the widows. The Bible has a lot to say about what the church is supposed to do, but it has qualifications for the widows who are to be cared for by the church. Let me go on. But the younger widows refuse. You don't take care of the younger ones. Those are the ones under 60. The younger widows refuse. 59 years old, you're still young. 
For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation. They've committed themselves to the Lord. They've committed themselves to serving the church. And then some really nice guy comes along and they give up their vows, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all, they learn to be idle. Ah, now I can be supported in the style to which I'd like to become accustomed. <laughs> they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. What he just described there was turning aside after Satan. We don't have time to expound that today, but look at that list of things that he said don't take anybody in under 60 who's been married to more than one man. She's got to be the wife of one man. And she has to be known, he says it twice in the passage, she has to be known for her good works, well reported of for good works, and then diligently followed every good work. You see, the Bible has a lot to say about our responsibility as Christians. Those passages were directed toward ladies. We find some directed toward men. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. In other words, some guys get away with their sin for a while and nobody knows it's going on. You've known people like that, right? You suspected something was going on, but then finally you found out some men they follow after. It's finally revealed. God is going to reveal it. He always does. You can't get away with anything. But the same is true with your good works. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. You know, you try to do it anonymously, you try to do it, but you know what? God will let those things be known too. First Timothy chapter 6. Paul writes a lot to Timothy. We've had this is the fourth passage in, in First Timothy where Paul's writing about good works. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, which giveth us richly all things to enjoy. You know some rich people? Do you know some rich Christians? I think if we were honest, we would look around the United States and say, all of us as Christians are rich. We are. We have incredible things that God has given to us, which 95% of the rest of the world doesn't even have access to much less possess. But they do good. Okay, rich guy, here's what God says. Don't keep focusing on your uncertain riches because that can fly away, make wings like an eagle and fly away to heaven. That's what the book of Proverbs says. What should you do? That you do good. That they be rich in good works. Ready to distribute. Willing to communicate. That word communicate there is the word for sharing. Instead of hoarding, sharing laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Paul's writing that to young Timothy. Young Timothy was just a young missionary pastor. And as you know, most pastors over the centuries simply haven't had a whole lot. But Paul says, Timothy, you're going to have some rich people in your congregation someday. And here is what you are supposed to exhort them to do. That they be rich in good works, there's true value. Everything else is going to burn up. It doesn't matter what you own, your house, your car, your boat. It doesn't matter what you've got in the bank. It doesn't matter what kind of jewelry you've got in your safe at home. It doesn't matter what you've got. It is going to burn up. But you can gain some other riches that are going to last forever, that they'd be rich in good works, ready to distribute. In other words, always looking for opportunities to use not what belongs to them. Did you know that nothing you have belongs to you? That it all belongs to God and you are only a steward of what you have. It's a stewardship that has been entrusted to you. A steward does not own anything even though he is responsible for the control and distribution of everything that his master has given to him and put under his hand. And it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Second uh, Corinthians chapter four, verse two.
that be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, that is to share, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Second Timothy chapter 3. Still writing to Timothy, last book of the Bible that was written. Uh, this is our last book of Paul's that was written. Chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. You know the first part of this. Do you know the last part? Do you ever pay attention to the last part? We focus on the inspiration part. On how it's the Bible that's inspired and not the Book of Mormon and not the Catechism and not the, you know, the Rig, uh, Bhagavad Gita or the Rig Veda or all of the other so-called holy books of all these other religions. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. We would all agree with that, right? Hello? Everybody who agrees that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, please raise your hand. Okay. We all agree. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. It's exhaled by God. And only the scripture. We know that it's profitable. We've talked about this in the past. It's profitable. In other words, it's not just there. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what? So what? What's the next verse say? That the man of God may be perfect. Teleos. Mature. It's designed to transform your life. That the man of God may be perfect truly furnished unto what? Three words. Let's say it together. All good works. Why did God give you the Bible? To tickle your intellect? To make you emotionally warm and fuzzy? Why did God give you the Bible? So that he could fit you fully and completely for all good works. You didn't get saved that way. But now that you are saved, God says, I'm transforming your life into the image of Christ. You know, the Gospels tell us Jesus went about doing good. He didn't go about just teaching theology. Jesus went about doing good. What do you think his miracles were all about? The healings. Was that good or bad? Was he showing something, demonstrating something about who the true and living God was by what he did? You and I have been called to demonstrate the true and living God by what we do, truly furnished unto all good works. Well, oh, they're the bad guys, too, and Paul talks about them. Second Timothy 4.14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. You see, rewards relate to works. Salvation relates to grace through faith. But rewards, fruit, harvest relates to works. Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Under the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. Here is the guy talking about God. But, oh, what an important word it is in this verse. But, in works, they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Do you think God has a few things to say about works? About the works of those who are the wicked and the works of those who are the elect? Does God say a few things about that? Here are people that talk the walk but they don't walk the walk. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Did you know your works deny what you say with your mouth? You know what that's called? Hypocrisy. We claim we believe one thing, and we've got all of our theology straight, and we've got all of our categories right, and we know the whole systematic theology of, of John Calvin and of Charles Hodges and all those great theologians of the past, and, and we've read all the works of Martin Luther, and we know all the Reformed doctrine, and we can put it down jot and tittle, and we can argue Arminians into the ground. How has it changed your life? How has it changed your life? Dear people, you know I strongly believe in all those doctrines. But it does no good if it doesn't transform your life. We've been called to live lives of holiness and righteousness and purity and godliness. 
lives that are pleasing to Jesus. And we want to do it because we love him. When you love somebody, you do what makes them happy. You really love Christ. How has it changed your life? How has it changed your life? Titus chapter 2, again for young men. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Timothy, you've got a big responsibility. You're a young man. Other young men are going to be looking up to you. Other young men are going to say, what would Timothy do in this situation? Timothy, you are a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Men, are you a pattern of good works? The idea is having a light shining up from underneath, and you've, some of you have seen the architect tables that have a light underneath and glass on the surface, and then you've, you've got your your parchment uh, on top of that and you've drawn something and then you're going to trace what you've drawn and so you another, lay another sheet of paper on top of that and the light shining through it shows the outline of what's to be copied on the paper above that's the idea that's here let the light of Christ shine through you Timothy so that you give them the pattern the exact outline so that as they put their paper on top, they can copy it exactly and they can come up with exactly what they should be like. But you know, if the light is turned off, you can barely see the outline underneath that you're supposed to trace. We must have the light of Christ shining through us so that others who place their paper, their lives, on top of ours. They say, I want to be like that man. I want to be like that lady. Here it's especially for young men. I want to be like that person. And they put their paper down on top. They can see very clearly and distinctly exactly where they should be tracing their lines. That's the word that Paul uses here. In all things, not just in most things, not just in some things, but in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Paul writes a lot of this to young Titus, who is also one of his young missionary evangelists, church planters. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Looking, excuse me, I, I, I've already uh, read that one. This is verse 13 and 14. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What are we supposed to be looking for, folks? looking for that blessed hope. You know, in almost all my letters I sign off with Titus chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, because that's what I'm looking for. And when you keep your eyes on the fact that Jesus could come back at any moment, how is that going to affect your life? If Jesus came back right now, think about your last week. Were there some points in your life during this last week or the last month or the last year? It doesn't matter. Are there some points there where you remember you were doing something and you would have been embarrassed out of your skin if Jesus came into the room right at that moment? Can you think of something? I suspect every one of us can. If we're looking for the blessed hope, if we're always expecting, Lord, it might be now, it might be now, it might be now, it might be now, it might be now. Do you know how that's going to change your life? Do you know how that's going to affect your life? Do you know how that's going to make you live a life of holiness and righteousness and purity? A godly life? A life that is a pattern of good works? If you know and believe with all your heart that Jesus could come back at any moment, if you really believe it, it transforms your life. Let me finish the verses. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. It changes your life. It makes you holy. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. Listen to the last four words. Zealous of good works. 
Are you zealous of good works? You say, well, I do a nice thing every now and then, help a little old lady across the street. You know, when, I, when it's not really out of my way, I mean, she's, you know, if she's 15 feet away, I'm not going to do that. Are you zealous of good works? Zealous means filled with fire. Your burning passion inside is to do good works that please Christ. Is it your desire with all your heart? Zealous of good works. Titus 3, next chapter, verse 8 and verse 14. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Do you wonder why I harp on this sometimes? Well, Paul told Titus, these are things that I want you to affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God. Are you a Christian? Have you believed in God? Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Whether you walked the sawdust path or you trusted him in your bedroom at night as you're kneeling down by your bed when you were a kid. Have you believed? Listen to what he says. These things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain, what are the next two words? Good works. You see, if you really believe, it changes the way you live. That they might be zealous of good works, that they might be careful to maintain good works, and it's not just sort of hidden kind of stuff that you do for yourself good works. It says these things are good and profitable unto men. It's going to be beneficial for somebody beside you. It is not a good work if it's just beneficial for you. I did something really good today, and man, did I make a lot of money on the stock market. I did something really good today, and I went out there, and I worked in my garden, and it's beautiful with all the flowers and stuff, and man, do I enjoy that. It says these things, that is the good works, are good and profitable unto man. Jumping down to verse 14. Let ours also, that is the believers, let ours also learn to maintain, next two words, say it together, good works. Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. That is one of the ways you demonstrate fruit bearing. Folks, good works are not for salvation. Good works are not for sanctification. But good works glorify Christ. Good works benefit the body of Christ. Good works are a manifestation of what's really inside of you, whether or not you have genuine faith or it's all a bunch of phoniness. Be careful to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. And it's not for salvation. That same chapter, just a few verses earlier, it said, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Your salvation, that was verse 5. Verse 5 says, you don't do good works to get saved. But verse 8 and verse 14 says, but be careful to maintain good works. That's not uh, uh, some kind of a basket in which you can say, wow, I can get rid of all my good works and I'd throw them out the window like this. No, there's a balance. The Christian life is a balance. The Christian life is a balance. We need to make sure that the reason we are doing things is according to Scripture. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Are you provoking? Well, of course, some of us provoke in the wrong kind of way. Are you provoking other believers in this church to good works? Are you? This is the context of a local church to which he's writing. He's writing to the church at Jerusalem. And they were going through some times of suffering and some times of real, real grim grim times that they were going through. And there are five warning passages in the book of Hebrews that are basically saying, don't give up the ship. Continue to live like a Christian because Jesus is coming. Five warning passages, and all five of them deal with loss of heavenly rewards. Not with salvation, you can't lose your salvation. All five warning passages in the book of Hebrews deal with the loss of heavenly rewards by people who decided they were no longer going to show that they were Christians by the way in which they lived. So that's why he says, provoke one another to good works. Hebrews 10, 24. Now you know the passage that everybody is always concerned about. In fact, Martin Luther 
uh, not having really studied this, I think, uh, said that James was a right straw epistle <laughs> because of what James says about works. James talks about two things. He talks about justification and he talks about imputation. I hope you know the difference between justification and imputation. Imputation is the transfer, it's a, a bookkeeping term, an ancient Greek bookkeeping term. It is the transfer of a balance from one account over to another account. Think about having two bank accounts and you've got a million dollars in this one account and you've got nothing in this account and you decide you're going to transfer $500,000 over to this account. And so you do it. That's what imputation is about. That's the word that's used for imputation. So when we talk about imputation, we talk about the imputation of Adam's sin to us. And we talk about the imputation of our sins to Christ. And we talk about the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. Three stages of imputation. We'll not talk about it in detail, but that's the three stages of imputation. Things that happen. Where something is being transferred to somebody else. You and I were in Adam when he sinned. That's the doctrine of federal headship. When Adam sinned, we became sinners because we were in his loins. And the book of Hebrews makes a big deal out of that and talks about it in the context of Melchizedek. So we became sinners. His sin was imputed to us. If we had been in Adam's place, we would have done exactly the same thing as Adam. Or if you're a woman, you would have done exactly the same thing as Eve, even if you were innocent. It's the doctrine of imputation. Then, when we trusted Christ, our sins, which was a negative balance on our ledger, was transferred to Jesus Christ. And at that moment, the divine righteousness of Christ, we did not work for it. It was by faith only. The divine righteousness of Christ was transferred to our account. And so we are righteous, not by works which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So any righteousness you have is because God put it on your account for Jesus' sake. That's imputation. Justification means to declare righteous, not to make righteous. That's what imputation is all about. Imputation is about making us righteous. Justification is the declaration of righteousness. So you can be declared righteous in the sight of God, which is what the book of Romans is about. You are declared righteous in the sight of God by faith and by faith alone. Justification is a declaration of righteousness. But James talks about justification by works. How does anybody know that you are righteous? How can they declare that you are righteous if they cannot see you doing anything? That's the point that James is making. James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? It's an interesting construction in Greek. It's, can that kind of faith save him? A guy who claims to have faith, but he doesn't have works. Now, we've already answered that question from several other passages that we read over here in these other epistles, but the answer is no. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, brother. Be ye warmed and filled. You see the guy starving and naked and he's rolling in the snow begging you for something to cover him up and a bite to eat. Hey, brother, be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful for the body. What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. The kind of faith that never shows up in real life is dead. It's dead, not sick, not feeble, not weak. It's dead. If you have nothing to show in your life, how your faith is coming out in life, it's dead. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works. 
So he asked the question, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. How do you prove faith? There's only one way to do it. Nobody can see inside you except God. And you're justified. You're declared righteous by God, by what he sees inside you. He knows how to, he can look inside you and know whether it's real or not. But I can't, and you can't with me or with anybody else. The only way you can see if I really believe, the only way I can see if you really believe, is what shows up in your life. What's the fruit that is there? Thou believest that there is one God. Hey, you got your theology straight. Thou believest, thou doest well. You know, that's right. There's only one God. We don't have 40 million gods. The Trinity is not three different gods. I mean, we believe in one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The, the Shema of Israel. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel. One God, one God. We got it. Okay, that's great. Did you know something? The devils also believe and tremble. They know who God is. He made them. They've been in his presence. They tremble when they realize there's the one God. That doesn't save them. Just believing in God won't save you either. But wilt thou know, O vain man, here it is the second time, that faith without works is dead. Was not our father Abraham justified? Now remember, difference between justification and imputation. Abraham was justified by works when he had offered his son Isaac upon the altar. That proved that Abraham believed. If he had talked about it theoretically, if he would talked about all the possibilities, uh, if he had sat down and worked mathematical equations out as to uh, what's rational and what's not rational, it wouldn't have proved anything. It's when he actually bound his son Isaac to the altar and lifted the knife. And God said from heaven, Avraham, Avraham, vayomer hineni, and he said, behold, here am I. God said, you don't have to kill that boy. I've got a lamb. God will provide for himself. Abraham knew it. God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. But it doesn't say God will provide for himself. It says God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And that's what God did at Calvary. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. God provided himself a lamb for the burnt offering. You see, he's declared righteous in our sight. Same with Rahab. She's also given as an illustration. Likewise, was also not Rahab the harlot justified by works? What did she do? She proved she believed because she received the messengers, sent them out another way. And so he concludes, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You prove what you believe by the way in which you live. I hope you get that lesson. I've done a sidetrack this morning, and I know I've done a sidetrack from locusts, but it was in the context. I had to give us some of those verses. Who is a wise man, chapter 3? Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. First Peter. Paul and James are not the only two who are writing this in the New Testament. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrim, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they, may, they speak against you as evildoers, listen to the next phrase, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, they'll see it, glorify God in the day of visitation. Do your pagan friends and co-employees and relatives and people with whom you come in contact, do they see your good works? The people who are bad-mouthing you as a Christian, do they see your good works which they shall behold, then glorify God in the day of visitation? Or are you too embarrassed because it might cost you something? You don't want to really demonstrate what your Christianity is all about because it might cost you something. Colossians 1.10, that you might work worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 and 17, 
Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Hebrews chapter 13, closing the book out. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you. In other words, God uses people. That's how he shows himself in the world around us today, through you. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Second Chronicles 15, 7. Be strong, therefore. Let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Galatians 6, 10 and 11. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially, very interesting word, the word especially there is the Greek word malista. That means, by that I mean to say, here is your focus. Not just going out and doing good works in the community, you know, volunteering for this and volunteering for that and volunteering for the other thing. Malista means, by that I mean to say, here's your focus of good works, especially unto them who are of the household of faith, that is, other believers. The world will see our love that we have for one another and that that will cause them to desire Christ because they see the love that believers have for each other. Most of the time they look at us and they say they're fighting all the time. A bunch of squabbling brats. They're always doing something sneaky and mean and dirty. Instead of us being known by our love for the brethren, and the way it's seen is through our good works. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here today. We pray that you will have taught us some lessons from the things that we have studied. We've gotten off track a little bit, but it's nonetheless so important that we learn this material because you've called us to live lives of holiness and purity and righteousness and to manifest that through the way in which we live. Our works not for salvation, not for sanctification, but for manifestation. Father, take your word and use it in each of our hearts and lives. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today.